Human beings are designed on an intermediate scale when viewed within the gigantic scope of the universe in which we live. We are hardly able to fathom the great distances of the cosmos. We are so small, and they are so vast. At the same time, we are too big to enter into the peculiar world of the microcosmos. But we have learned that everything in the universe behaves according to the rules of interaction between elemental particles, the same universal building blocks that came into being with the Big Bang. The day we were able to fully describe those building blocks will be the day we discover the reason for everything, maybe even the reason for human existence. On December 29, 1959, the eminent physicist Richard Phillips Feynman, who would be awarded the Nobel Prize six years later, presented his ideas at a physics conference at Caltech. The principles of physics as I understand them do not deny the possibility of manipulating things atom by atom. Problems in chemistry and biology could be avoided if we were able to develop the means to see what we were doing and to make things at an atomic level progress that I do not think can be delayed any longer. Manipulating matter atom by atom, making things at an atomic level. As fate would have it, this spectacular proposition failed to cause much of a stir among Feynman's learned audience. But of course, he may have been the only one present who could foresee that his prediction would one day constitute a veritable scientific revolution. This is the IBM Research Center in Almaden, California. Here is where Dr. Don Eigler, a physicist specializing in atomic scale structures, works. He is possibly the world's foremost authority in this field. So what we're going to do now is we're imaging an area of the surface with a scanning tunneling microscope. And this is just 12 nanometers across, left to right. This is a surface of the material copper and on top of it we have some carbon monoxide molecules. Each one of these dips is an individual carbon monoxide molecule. This is where the copper crystal goes up one layer of atoms, it goes up we call it a step. Eigler was the first to show the world that Feynman's ideas were not so far from reality. In 1989, he proved his point by manipulating just 35 xenon atoms to draw a company's logo on a metal surface. The way we move atoms is with really a very remarkable instrument that we have in our laboratory. It's called a scanning tunneling microscope. Sometimes people just call it an STM. This is an instrument which uses a metal needle, very sharp metal point, to image a surface. What we learned was how to use this same metal needle not only to image a surface, but to move individual atoms. We just bring the end of the needle so close to the atoms that we want to move that it can pull on the individual atoms. And we pull the individual atoms to where we want them to go along the surface. By doing this uh, in a repeated and in a very controlled way, we can build structures at the atomic scale with atomic scale precision. To manipulate things atom by atom, to make things at an atomic level, Feynman was right. There were no physical impediments to it. The problem is size. We're too large to move atoms as if they were chess pieces. But we've begun to develop systems that may offset this handicap. For the first time, we are able to get in direct touch with the essence of existence, 
something that for 25 centuries we could only imagine. We are part of a much larger, diverse environment made up of matter. Our reality is made up of living things and inert things, of liquid bodies, solid bodies, of objects with different colors and textures. However, everything that exists seems to act according to the same laws. Objects fall to the ground because of the force of gravity. Solids turn to liquids when heated, and liquids to gases. How can things of such different natures act alike? What does all matter have in common? The matter that surrounds us, the matter of which we are made. From the very beginning of our existence, mankind has asked questions about the physical essence of the natural world. In ancient Greece, Thales of Miletus, considered the first physicist, came to the conclusion that everything was made of water. Later on, Anaximander posited that air was the basic building block of all matter. Then Heraclitus argued that no, it was fire. The first atomic theory of matter dates from the year 450 BC. A philosopher, Democritus of Abdera, believed that everything was made up of very small particles, smaller than we could see or even imagine. He hypothesized that there were an infinite number of particles of all shapes and sizes. Democritus invented the word atom, a Greek term meaning indivisible. The first real connection between atoms per se and physics took place in the early 19th century. A versatile English chemist named John Dalton dared to think about weighing atoms. As strange as that seemed, it was certainly a logical line of reasoning. Atoms are material entities and therefore ought to be weighable. Dalton, of course, did not try to weigh each atom and calibrate its heft in grams, but he did manage to figure out when one atom was heavier than another. In fact, he was the first scientist to propose classifying atoms by their weight. Needless to say, Dalton probably didn't realize that he was toying with one of the primary bases of modern physics.